Well, good morning. I see you made it through the metric, cent- the metric marathon, sorry, the metric marathon this morning. If you made it on your way in, glad you made it here this morning. We're continuing our sermon series on world religions. And I thought I'd, well, let me start with this question this morning. How many people here like to travel? Like to travel, right? And you, I know some of the places you like to go because I hear about your great trips. Well, has anybody ever thought about traveling to the Holy Land? Or going to the Middle East, right? It's kind of an exotic destination. Not some, it's not a Caribbean trip, but a lot of times people want to go to the Holy Land and to Israel to see the Holy Land. And so I thought what I'd do this morning is take you to the Holy Land just for a couple minutes to kind of take a tour of old Jerusalem this morning. You ready to go with me on a little tour of Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem? Okay, I've been, I was there, wow, 20 years ago, 1995, long time. But it's still the same, believe me. This is it. So first place we're going to go is a place called the Dome of the Rock. And this sits up on what's called the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, this is up on a high place. So if you look at a picture of Jerusalem, you might see this gold dome shimmering in the sunlight when you look at the city from an aerial photo. And so this is the Dome of the Rock. This is a mosque where the, where the Muslims worship at this, this mosque on that Temple Mount. And the reason it's called the Dome of the Rock, obviously, because there's that gold dome, but underneath of that dome is a rock, a large rock, where they believe that Abraham goes all the way back to the Old Testament, the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 21, and actually Genesis, a couple chapters in Genesis, but Abraham offered up his son Isaac as a sacrifice, and then God provides a ram in a thicket for that sacrifice, and so Abraham ends up not doing that because that's not something that God ultimately wanted him to do. So there's that story in the Old Testament, and they worship there because they believe that that is the rock where Abraham took Isaac. And so the the Islam, Muslims in Islam, traces its roots all the way back to Abraham through one of Abraham's two sons. Abraham had another son whose name wasn't Isaac, but his other son's name was Ishmael. And Ishmael was the son of Abraham. Hagar. Now, I know this is going to sound like a soap opera here in a minute, but I'm going to explain it to you. It's kind of like it is today. You know, you got to try and keep all the family members straight. But Hagar was the maidservant to Abraham's wife, Sarah. And when Sarah couldn't have a child, they, even though God had promised them a child, they thought, hey, we'll take matters into our own hands. So Sarah gave Hagar to her husband, Abraham, who then she produced the child, Ishmael. Then later, when Sarah did give birth to Isaac, the one we just heard about, he then, she then went to Abraham and says, I don't want Hagar and Ishmael around anymore. Kick them out of the family. And so what happened in the story was that Hagar and Ishmael were, were sent away by Abraham. And God promised in the Genesis chapter 1 that they would become a great nation. So the Islamic faith, the Muslims trace their roots back to Abraham through Ishmael and Hagar. The Jewish faith is tracing its roots back to Abraham through Isaac and Sarah. So two different sons of Abraham lead to these two different religious faiths that we're talking about this morning. So that's the Dome of the Rock, a little bit about that. Now, if you take a walk down off the Temple Mount, you'll come to this wall. And this wall is called the Wailing Wall. This is where the, Jewish, the folks of the Jewish faith, they come to this wall and they offer prayer and they worship and they, remember, they recite scripture and they learn the Torah there and they have bar mitzvahs there and all these things play, happen there because this wall is all that's left of the temple, the original temple where they worshiped up until 70 AD when Rome came in and destroyed the temple and that's all that's left of that temple. So for them, that's a very holy, sacred place that they can go and worship. So if you, and then if you take another walk down a few streets and down a street called the Via Della Rosa, you will come to a place called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And that church is the Christian church that, re, that celebrates and reminds people of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, is, is, is commemorated there and worshiped there. So this is a Christian holy site where they believe Jesus was buried and rose from the dead. So here's what I want you to think about, that you don't need a taxi cab to get to all three sites. You can walk to each of these sites in old Jerusalem. And as much as we hear about on the news every week about crisis in the Middle East, and we've been hearing that probably most of our lives, 
is that there are people, Christians and Jews and Muslims, that walk by each other every day and there's never a problem. Every day they go to these places. Every day they go to these sites and there's never anything worth putting on the news. So most of the time, what I'm suggesting is they found a way to get along. <laughs> it's the extremists, it's the radicals, it's the, it's the other poles that are always getting into the news and getting attention. And I think we have to keep that in mind that the vast majority of people of all these faiths are peace, peaceable people. We particularly think about that when we think of Islam, right? I mean, what do you think? When I say Muslim, Islam, what, what do you, what's your initial thought? What does that take you to? What, 9-11, what else? Violence. Violence, what else? ISIS, right? Terrorism, that's what we kind of, we've come to associate that with Islamic faith. And even if you, the motto of Islam, I'm going to share you, with you the motto of Islam, for lack of a better word, but what their main belief is, is this. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. That's basically their slogan. That's their, lo their motto. And in fact, that's on the flag of ISIS. So when you see the ISIS flag, if you could read Arabic, that's what it would say. And so we often associate this type of behavior, radical behavior, and violent behavior with this faith. Here's the, tru here's the reality. 99.9% .9 of Muslims are not extreme terrorists. They're simply trying to follow God. <laughs> and I'm going to share a little bit more about what they're trying to do with their life. So, but because our media sensationalizes this, we tend to us make that association. I don't want, I mean, the crusaders, when they went and killed people in the name of the Christian faith, they wore crosses on their shields. I don't want people to think that we're a violent religion because the crusaders had a cross on their shields. You see what I'm saying? It's not guilty. We, all, we can't make the mistake of guilty by association, much like what happened to Ahmed Muhammad this week. Ahmed went to school. He built a clock and had a lot of wires in a case. And he went and he showed it to one of his teachers and he said, uh, look, I built this clock. And the teacher says, oh, that's pretty cool. You're a pretty smart kid. And then he went and he showed it to another teacher and the teacher thought it was a bomb and the police came in and they arrested Ahmed because Ahmed is a Muslim. And they made the assumption, the false assumption, that it was a bomb, even though he was all along saying, this is a clock, this is a clock, I made a clock. And so there was this misrepresentation, this misassumption, this misconception that it was created in one person's mind that led to his arrest and led to basically media, a lot of media attention and so forth. Anybody see that on the news this week about Ami, the kid with the clock they thought was a bomb, right? And that it, how, much, how would that have been different had that he not been Muslim? Would it have been different? I don't know. I, I, I hope that we would have handled it differently either way, that we've learned something from that. So here's what the Islamic faith is, it believes. There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. 99.9% .9 of them are not violent, radical, extremists. So here, what are they practicing? So here's what they're practicing. They're, ever heard the five pillars of Islam? Anybody hear five pillars? Anybody know what the five pillars are? Can they recite the five pillars? Well, you're going to learn right now in a very brief moment, right? Pillar number one is belief. Believe that there's one God and believe that Muhammad is the prophet. That's the belief, the basic belief. That's pillar number one. Pillar number two is prayer. Muslims, devout, let me make a distinction here because this is true of all faiths. Devout Muslims pray five times a day. When I was in Cairo, the call to prayer would go off, like woke me up in the middle of the night one night, you know, 3 a.m. in the morning, prayer, call to prayer goes off. I didn't see everybody rushing to their prayer mats at 3 a.m. in the morning. But and even during the day when the call to prayer would go off, that some people would actually stop and pray, and then others would keep doing business or driving cabs or doing whatever, and they didn't stop. And so there's always a difference between devout Muslims and cultural Muslims, and devout Christians and cultural Christians, and devout Jews and cultural Jews. So we always have to keep that in mind as well. And so uh, they call to prayer five times a day. I don't know that that's, I, for me, that's impressive. You know, we are to pray, actually, as Christians. How often are we to pray as Christians? Without ceasing. <laughs> We're always to be in an attitude of prayer and a mindset of prayer. So there's the prayer. Number three is fasting. Fasting is the month of Ramadan. They celebrate Ramadan. And Ramadan is a remembrance 
of Muhammad fleeing from a city called Mecca to another city called Medina. I want to tell you this story a little bit because I think it's interesting. Because in the city of Mecca at the time of Muhammad, they worshipped over 300 gods. And they had a lot of different gods that the people were worshipping. And Muhammad was trying to figure all this out. And you know who Muhammad started talking to? He started talking to some Christians and to some Jewish people. And he learned this idea that there was one God, not 300 gods. And he began to accept that as a part of his own faith that there's one God. That's where they get that idea from. So I want you to understand that he gets that idea from Christians and Jews. And then he takes that idea and he starts to preach that idea in the city of Mecca where the people are worshiping 300 gods. And now what do you think the religious community of Mecca thinks about Muhammad when he comes in with the message of one God and they're trying to worship 300 gods? What do you think they do to him? They say, you're out of here, buddy. Right. That happened to Jesus too, by the way. And so Muhammad flees from Mecca and has to get, you know, flee and leave everything behind, didn't have any food, and had to flee to Medina where he, held, he, was, he found refuge in Medina. And then that's, where the, that's actually where the Muslim faith and the, the teachings of Muhammad start, is from that city of Medina, and then they come back to Mecca. And he was a warrior, he was a military uh, leader, and so that's why some of those teachings are centered around military and, war and making war. So then the fourth pillar is charity. And now Muslims are, are asked to give 2.5% of their income to the poor, to charity, to the needy. So don't, I know we talk about tithing 10% around here, so don't all go converting to, be Islam, to Islam because, you know, they require less charity. Actually, we know that the average American, the average Christian American only gives about 1% to 1.5%, so 2.5% would be great for everybody, for the poor, for the needy. And then the f number five is pilgrimage. Every Once in a lifetime, a, a Muslim is to make a pilgrimage to Mecca and remember the, the journey of Hagar and Ishmael from Abraham, and that's what they remember in their pilgrimage. So those are the five things they strive for in their faith, in their religious path. Now I want you to listen to what the motto of Judaism is. And I want you to listen to see, are there any similarities with the motto of Islam. And the motto of Judaism is, comes from a place in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And if you ever walk into a Jewish household, a devout Jewish household, you'll see something called a mezuzah on the door frame. It holds in that, in that little tube or in that little case on their door frame is this verse. And they may kiss it in, on their way or touch it on the way in and out of their house to remind them every day of this verse, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. How many gods do they worship in Judaism? <laughs> One, right? Same idea, same concept, going back to Abraham, right? And the other thing is that Islam, in Islam, Muslims are trying to surrender their lives to God and to God's will. In a same, very similar way, Jewish folks are trying to live their lives totally given over to God, 100%, all heart, mind, body, and soul to God. So these are good things that, these peop that people are striving for in these faiths. Now one thing I've always been curious about, we live in Howard County, and I, I have friends that are Jewish and neighbors that are Jewish. How many people have friends, neighbors that are Jewish here? Yeah, we got a lot. You know, we're, like I said last week, we, Howard County is a unique place. We have multiple face uh, people of different faiths here. And so um, have you ever wondered what synagogue they, I mean, I always talk, and they say, well, I go to this synagogue. It's a reform synagogue, or it's a, and we are going, that's like you or I saying to them, I'm Episcopalian, or I'm Methodist. You know, they don't understand that either. So I'm going to give you a little primer here real quickly. There are three types of synagogues here in our community, and three types of synagogues in Judaism. After they stopped worshiping at the temple, they went to a synagogue system where they teach the Torah. And so all of them teach the Torah. The first one is called a Orthodox synagogue. Now, Orthodox believe in not only the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament, 
But they also believe in the sacred writings of what's called the Talmud, which is a collection of interpretations of the Torah and how to live the Torah life and how to live by right conduct and right code. Then the con- there's a conservative synagogue. So you've got your orthodox synagogue, you've got conservative synagogue. The conservative synagogue follows the Torah and some of the Talmud. They're kind of a little bit looser on the Talmud. And they believe in also practicing and remembering the history of Israel. And then the third type, you've got orthodox, conservative, and the third type is the reformed. The reformed only focus on the Torah. They don't focus on the Talmud. They also don't believe in a physical Messiah. So they believe there's going to be a Messiah, but it's a spiritual reality, not a physical person. And they also don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They, they believe in the immortal soul, but the immortal soul simply goes to the, to the grave, to Sheol, and they don't believe in a life ever after, eternal life with God, so to speak. And so that, and there are varying degrees of all those things. I'm giving you basically a very simplified version. So you think about all that, and all that, all that is about one God and being devoted to that one God and living a certain type of life. And then Jesus gives us John chapter 10. And in John chapter 10, Jesus starts to explain more about who Jesus is. And it's important because this is where we start to begin to understand the uniqueness of Christianity, even though we also trace our roots back to Abraham and Isaac. And we also believe that there's one God. And we also believe that we're to live a life of right conduct. But that's not the starting point for us. That's not the path for us. John chapter 10 explains to us about the good shepherd. And he talks about who the good shepherd is and what the good shepherd does. And gives us an idea of who God is and who Jesus is. And it says there in that passage that Jesus says, I am the gate to the sheep pen. Another translation says, I am the door, right? So there's a door in a sheep pen. In fact, if you were, so let's go back. I'm going to transport you back to the first century for a minute. You ready to go back with me and understand shepherding for just a little bit? So in the first century, a shepherd would create a sheepfold or a sheep pen. He would go and he would find a big cliff. And they would find a cliff and they would make the cliff one wall so, so nobody could get into the sheep pen from the cliff. So then the other thing they would do is they would then build a, start building a wall from the edge of the cliff to form a pen. And they would take stones from the desert rocks and they would build a wall about waist high. And then that would be there to, keep the, to make the pen and keep the sheep in the pen. And then on top of that wall they would place thorn branches. Now this was for protection of the sheep, not so much to keep the sheep in as it was to keep the sheep protected from predators, thieves, robbers, as mentioned in the text. And then the wall would be built, the thorns would be on top of the wall, and that would create the sheep pen, and then they would leave an opening in the wall. And that was the gate to the sheep pen. And the shepherd would take his staff, and as he would call the sheep into the pen, they would know his voice. Sometimes they would sing to the sheep or whistle to the sheep, or they'd have some way of communicating. And he would count the sheep as they came in, and if one of his sheep wasn't wasn't his sheep he would put his staff down and he'd say you know you go over to the other pen you know with the other shepherd and so forth and that's how they would do that and so he would use his staff as a gateway to let the sheep in sheep in and let them out and then there were times at night after all the sheep were in the pen guess where the shepherd would sleep in the gate in the opening you know they didn't actually make a gate the shepherd would actually become the gate to the pen and he was there with his staff to protect the sheep. You ever heard Psalm 23, thy rod and thy staff, they, they do what? They comfort me. Why, how would a staff comfort, a shepherd's staff comfort the sheep? It was there for their protection. They felt secure. They felt safe when their shepherd had that staff that could fend off wild animals, that could fend off thieves and robbers. And so literally the shepherd becomes the gate. And Jesus is saying that that he's the gate. (laughs) He's the gate to the sheep pen, and this is mentioned all throughout the Gospels in different ways. So I want you to think about it this way. In fact, I want you to pretend, how many people have seen Mission Impossible? 
dun, 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 you know. <laughs> Keep your day job, Matt. All right, so, so I want you to put your Mission Impossible hat on for a second. And I want you to imagine that your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to break into Fort Knox. Now, Fort Knox is where $337 billion worth of gold bullion held by the U.S. is in Fort Knox. It's behind a vault made of granite walls and a 22-ton blast door. If you were to make it that far, you would have to get by armed guards. A minefield surrounds that complex. There are video cameras, microphones that detect sound, and if they detect sound, they set up an alarm. Multiple alarm systems. Defenses are electrocuted. They have a razor wire around the tops of all those electric fences. And if that weren't enough, they also have Apache helicopters that patrol the area from aerial attack. You actually, that's a bomb-proof roof on that building and Apache helicopters patrolling, and if they need it, it's right next to Fort Knox, which holds 30,000 U.S. troops that they could call upon. If everybody, anybody tried to go in there, they would call those 30,000 troops to defend Fort Knox. Now, how would you break in? How would you get in to Fort Knox? You, what would you need, thinking you're an agent, a spy, a, a Mission Impossible theme right here, right? What would you need? You need a plan, right? You need a plan. What else do you need? Well, stay with me. Stay with me. <laughs> what else would you need? You need plans. You need to know where the minefields were. You need to know. You need to have tools to cut things, cut wires, cut fences. You need some arm. You'd need some uh, guns yourself, probably, because you have armed guards. You'd need some rocket launchers to shoot down the hell. You know, you'd have to come up with a very elaborate system to get in there. What's that? About as much money as I'd get. Yeah, it'd probably cost you $337 billion just to break in, right? <laughs> but, as someone already mentioned, what if you knew the guard that guarded the gate to the vault? And that guard said to you, hey, come on in. I'll invite you in, and I'll let you in because you know me. Wouldn't that be the easiest way in? I think it, uh, sometimes we look at religion, we look at heaven as some formula or some system or some pl elaborate plan we have to create or come up with to get in. <laughs> when what Jesus is saying is, if you know me, you're in. <laughs> My sheep know me and I know them. And basically what he's saying is that if you know me, the gatekeeper, the gate actually, then you are, you're in. <laughs> it's pretty simple. If you're a friend of mine, you get in to the sheep pen. And in fact, he says in the passage, I have other sheep that don't know that yet, and I want them to know that, and I want them to come in. As we talked about last week, God desires all to be in the pen. And so that's what Jesus is saying. I am the gate. You know me, you're in. There's no secret levers. There's no secret handshake. There's no secret formula. There's no code that you have to punch in. Just simply know the shepherd. And the other thing that's really cool, and the thing that convinces me that Christianity represents a loving God is that Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep in that passage. And what a good shepherd does is he actually lays down at night in that opening to the sheep pen so that any predator comes, he is going to lay down his life to protect his sheep. He's not going to run away like a hired hand. And that image of me is of a good shepherd, and that's the image Jesus is giving us, that he's saying, I'm the one that is willing to lay down his life. All these other folks, all these, you know, he's talking actually to the Pharisees at this point. He's saying, they're, they're, they're just hired hands. I'm a good shepherd. I will protect you. I will take care of you. I will lay down my life for you. And that's what convinces me that Christianity represents a God of love. You know, there was a man whose house was robbed one night. Somebody broke in to his house, took all his money, took all his possessions, even his big screen TV. He was weeping. He was crying. He lost everything in this robbery, and so he was out 
at a neighborhood picnic the next day, and he was sharing with his neighbors and his friends what had happened, how his home had gotten broken into, and how he had lost everything. And he said to them, is there any way you guys could help me out until I can get back on my feet? Could you just help me so that I can get my life back together? And one, one friend said to him, says, well, you know, maybe in the future you shouldn't talk so much about your big screen TV. Maybe you shouldn't go broadcasting that you've got all this good stuff at your house. Maybe you shouldn't brag about that stuff. Maybe just keep it to yourself in the future. And then another neighbor said to him, said, well, you know, if, if you would just simply go to Home Depot and they, they make these really heavy-duty locks at Home Depot, just go buy some of those locks and, and put new locks on new doors and new locks on your house that are more durable so they can't break in. And then his third neighbor said to him, you know what, I, I got an idea. Why don't you call my alarm company? I've got an alarm system on my house. If you would just call the alarm company and just install, have them install this alarm system in your house, that'll, that'll set off an alarm if somebody tries to break in again. And we've even got video cameras now that you can have, that you can get from them. So after the man left to barbecue, he went home, and you know what, he cried again. Because nobody helped him. Everybody had advice for him, but nobody was willing to help him get back on his feet. That's the thing about Jesus Christ. That's the thing about Christianity. That's the uniqueness is that it's not just about telling, giving people religious advice on how to live a spiritual life. It's about the act of the good shepherd who actually did something about it, who actually laid down his life for the sheep, who actually acted on love and represents a God of love and grace who desires all you, who says all you have to do is come to me, the good shepherd who lays down his life for you. Amen.